Dr. Hyman is famous. He has uh, written several books, and if you, how many of you are sugar addicts? Yeah, pretty much all of us. Um, we're going to learn today how we can kick that habit and eat healthier and just be better overall health-wise. So would you please welcome Dr. Mark Hyman. Thanks everybody, uh, thanks for showing up. I know you got a lot going on. Can you hear me okay? So yeah, she said, who's a sugar addict? And half of you raised your hands and probably the other half are carb addicts. So <laughs> who's ever uh, worried about, you know, how much starch and sugar they're eating and tried to like cut down? Yeah, well, here's the thing. You know, we're programmed to love sweet things because everything that you find in nature that's sweet is safe to eat. If it's bitter, it could kill you, but sweet is safe. So we're programmed, and also, when there was scarcity, we were programmed to find as much sugar and eat as much as we could because our bodies store it way better than anything else. So as soon as you eat something starchy or sugary, your body stores it and it drives your brain chemistry to want more. And so you're gonna eat like, if you're a bear, you're gonna eat hundreds of pounds of berries in the summer and you're gonna gain 500 pounds and you're gonna you know, get diabetic and hypertensive and obese, but then you sleep all winter. The problem is we just keep eating all winter long. So uh, what I want to do today is sort of take you through the science of sugar and sugar addiction and the biology of it and how to use science, not willpower, to get healthy and fix your, your body. Because sugar is the biggest driver of almost every single major chronic disease. And when I say sugar, I also mean flour, which are pretty much the same thing in the body. In fact, flour is worse than sugar in terms of how it affects your body. Uh, and whether it's heart disease, cancer, diabetes, even dementia, they're calling it type 3 diabetes. So we have a problem. 70% uh, of us are overweight, 40% of kids are overweight. I call this diabetes. This is this sort of spectrum of everything from a little bit of belly fat all the way to prediabetes to full-blown type 2 diabetes. But anywhere along that spectrum, your health is compromised and you're in trouble. Uh, and there's a vicious cycle that we do with dieting, which is we, we starve ourselves. So the basic idea of our culture and of the science is to eat less and exercise more. It's what the government tells us, it's what nutritionists tells us, it's what doctors tell us, and yet it isn't true that it works. Who's tried to eat less and exercise more, and how's that working for you? Not so good, right? Because willpower doesn't work, you can't just starve yourself, because your body compensates by losing weight initially, and then your metabolism slows, then you starve, then you overeat, then you gain the weight back, and you gain back more than you lost and then you actually lose muscle and fat when you lose the weight and you gain back all fat so your metabolism is slower and you need to eat less even when you're at the same weight. It's like a mess and this vicious cycle happens over and over for people when they don't understand how to design a way of eating, not a diet, but a way of eating that's going to fix their hormones, fix their metabolism, fix their brain chemistry so they are craving the right things instead of the wrong things. Uh, so here's the concept here. We believe that it's all about calories, it's all about energy. You know, you eat less, you exercise more, you're going to lose weight. There's just a math problem. But it's not a math problem, it's a metabolism problem that's driven by hormones and inflammation and all sorts of things that are affected by the quality of what we eat. So it turns out the quality of what you eat is far more important than the quantity. And you can't really control how much you eat with willpower, but you can control what you eat. So if you focus on what you eat, you don't have to worry about the how much. Uh, and certain foods are really <laughs> driving this behavior. You know, in America, we eat a huge amount of starch and sugar, about 152 pounds of sugar, 133 pounds of flour, we'll talk about. And it affects the brain in a way that's pretty frightening. Uh, it's actually not just a, an emotional issue. People think, oh, I'm just, you know, craving this, craving that, or I, you know, I just like to eat carbs when I feel sad or lonely. It's actually, uh, physiological addiction, just like heroin or cocaine. So the, the diets fail because we really focus on calories in, calories out. We don't understand that we should be focusing on this whole biology of addiction. Uh, and uh, you know, the science is really there around what we need to do to fix that. And there's a lot of implications for policy and treatment. You know, when we stop focusing on energy balance, which by the way, all the soda companies love because they can say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter if you're eating the right amount of calories, it doesn't matter if it comes from soda or broccoli, it's the same. Now intuitively that doesn't even make sense, but that's actually what the party line is. Uh, so the whole idea of exercise more, eat less doesn't really work. In fact, um, you say, well, Dr. Hyman, what about the 
physics. You know, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy is conserved in a system, meaning, you know, it, it should be calories in, calories out. But it's very different when you understand what this means. In a system, means a closed system. So yes, if you burn a thousand calories of broccoli and a thousand calories of soda in a lab, they release the same amount of energy, a calories amount of energy needed to raise one liter of water one degree centigrade. But if you eat them, it's very different because they have to go through your metabolism and they affect your hormones and your brain chemistry. So the same thing with like feathers and lead. If I said, you go off uh, a bridge and drop them, you know, the feathers are going to go like this and a pound of lead is going to go right down to the bottom quickly. Whereas if you drop them in a vacuum, they drop at the same rate, right? It's a very different uh, thing when you look at what it means when it's not in a closed system. So the quality of our diet matters. It affects our immune system. It affects our hormones. It affects everything. So the quality and the composition of our diet really matters. Uh, here's a great uh, cartoon. It says, Eat less, exercise more. That's the most ridiculous fad diet I've ever heard of. It really doesn't work. Um, so we got to get out of this whole calories in, calories out. You know, the whole idea of moderation is, is a party line from the food industry. Uh, and the idea that exercise is a solution is really a problem. Uh, Parade Magazine is doing an article about how many people believe that if they exercise enough, they can eat whatever they want. There's no way you can exercise your way out of a bad diet. If you just have one soda, you have to actually walk four and a half miles to burn it off. If you have one supersized meal, you have to run every single day four miles to burn off one meal. If you have a supersized meal every day, you would literally have to run a marathon every single day to keep up. So there's no way you can exercise your way out of a bad diet. Exercise is important. And this book by Michael Moss called Salt, Sugar, and Fat detailed interviews with over 300 food industry experts, scientists, executives, former people, detailing how they deliberately design food to be addictive. The mouthfeel, the taste, the sugar, the salt. They create the bliss point of food. They create uh, heavy users by targeting you know, people who are already using and getting them to use more. They have craving experts who really design the food to be done a certain way. Uh, and it's a trillion dollar industry. It's a huge industry that drives this whole thing. So uh, we now know that, that it's actually not sh fat that's causing the problem. We thought fat was making you fat. Fat was the bad guy. Turns out that it's not fat that makes you fat. It's sugar that makes you fat. It's not fat that causes heart disease. It's sugar that does. And the dietary guidelines in 2015 actually reversed 35 years of bad advice, which is to cut the fat and cut the cholesterol. Now they say, don't worry about dietary cholesterol. Don't worry about how much fat you're eating. They say still restrict saturated fat, but that's a whole other story, which I think we're going to change. Um, and you know, you can see these studies just show that even if you're not overweight, you say, well, I'm not fat, so it doesn't matter. I eat sugar, I'm still skinny. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. You get what we call skinny fat. That's when you look skinny, but you're actually fat on the inside, or toffee, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And it, and it has to do with all the where the organ fat is, and even a normal body weight, if you eat a lot of sugar, you're going to get more heart disease. Uh, so it's this massive amount. We eat about a three quarters of a pound of flour and sugar every single day for every man, woman, and child in America. Now, I'm not having that much. Some of you must be having a little more. Um, and it's frightening. You know, we, we, we have so much. There's 600,000 products on the market. 80% have added sugar. You know, 20% of our calories come from sugar-sweetened beverages, whether they're soda or coffee or energy drinks. Uh, high fructose corn syrup is the highest uh, source of calories in our diet. And sugar in kids' diets is even more. They eat about 34 teaspoons a day. Now, you wouldn't put 34 teaspoons of sugar in your coffee, but you can easily get that by drinking, you know, a soda or two. And what happens in the brain is fascinating. There's an area in the brain that is designed to regulate our behavior that has to do with dopamine. This is our pleasure center. Uh, and when you activate this pleasure center, you keep wanting to activate it. And there are a lot of things that activate it. You know, heroin, cocaine, cigarettes, alcohol, sex, um, you know, and, and, uh, and even altruism activates this. So it's better to focus on the last thing. <laughs> and, and, and what's interesting is if you look at people's brains, people who are overweight and who are cocaine addicts have the same area of their brain that are lit up. And in human studies, they've actually found that it, it actually lights it up even if you don't know what you're eating. They hide what's in the food and they give them different milkshakes with different amounts of, uh, of, of higher low glycemic starch. And if you're taking the high glycemic starch that actually stimulates your your insulin, and your blood sugar, you literally activate this area that's the same area that gets activated with cocaine or heroin. And the problem is we're eating it everywhere. Your sugar, sweetened, quote, fruit, healthy, light, non-fat morning yogurt has more sugar per ounce than a can of soda. Uh, your Prego tomato sauce or your tomato sauce has more sugar per serving than two Oreo cookies. And of course, orange juice is just like 
drinking soda with a little fiber. And of course, the advertising out there is so confusing. You know, you see, you know, whole grain cookie crisp cereal with 22 teaspoons of uh, sugar. <laughs> I mean, 22 grams of sugar, which is like five teaspoons of sugar, there's six different types of sugar, and it's heart healthy because it has a few flakes of whole grains in it. Um, so soda and sugar-sweetened beverages are the worst. You know, one can of soda increases the risk of kid being overweight by 60%. If you're a woman, you have one soda a day, you have an 80% increased risk of getting diabetes and, of course, um, heart disease. So uh, this is from uh, the American Beverage Association. This guy, under oath, in front of Congress, testified and said this, in a well-balanced diet, we need two liters of liquids a day. Soft drinks can be a healthy part of that intake, and I would reject any argument that they're in any way harmful. Uh, I guess he didn't read this article, that there's 130, 184,000 deaths a year from drinking sugar-sweetened beverages from heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So this was in Circulation Journal. Uh, and of course, we don't even know how much is in where stuff we're eating. You wouldn't put 15 teaspoons of sugar in your coffee, but you easily could have it in uh, one soda. This is basically 15 teaspoons of sugar in one soda. And of course, there's new and improved, I call it liquid death, uh, which is the diet drinks, uh, which also turn out, affect your microbiome, affect your metabolism, create insulin resistance. So they're not, you know, diet in any way. Uh, and uh, of course, there's a new form, which is Diet Coke Plus with vitamins and minerals, which I guess is healthy for you, right? Um, I don't know how, I, I wonder, do they really think we're that stupid? Maybe, maybe. So the whole idea of, of dieting and, and, and restricting your calories and starvation doesn't work because it goes against our biology, which is to protect us against starvation. So we'll, we'll slow our metabolism, we'll get hungrier, we'll actually uh, want to eat more and, and crave more starch and sugar. So all these things really play a big role. So how does the composition of our diet affect our hunger and metabolism? If you can, again, control what you eat, you don't have to worry about how much. Um, so this is actually a woman who, um, went on a uh, liposuction treatment, who was very overweight, who had uh, a lot of inflammation, bad cholesterol, blood sugar issues, and they took out 40 pounds of fat with liposuction. The problem is, um, if you look at the CAT scan, you see the organs are all covered with fat, and that did not go away. The liver, the kidneys, the intestines, all covered in fat. That's called organ fat or visceral fat, and that's the dangerous fat that causes diabetes, heart disease, and everything else. So she didn't really have any benefit from any of her biomarkers or her blood tests or her blood pressure, anything, nothing got better, even though she lost 40 pounds of fat, which was just under the skin. And there was a benefit. She did go from wearing a psychological benefit, maybe. She'd go from wearing a panty to the thong, so maybe there's a benefit. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so maybe liposuction's not all bad. Um, now, this, the question here is, does being hungry make you overweight? Or does being overweight make you hungry? Because right now we believe that overeating makes you gain weight. Turns out that's not true. It turns out that when you start eating starch and sugar, it starts to put on these special fat cells in your stomach that make you hungry. So being overweight makes you hungry. And that is the opposite of what we were taught, which is that overeating makes you hungry. And so it's the, the, the whole visceral fat biology, which is fascinating, which is this whole um, dynamic environment inside your organs and your organ fat is actually regulating your immune system, regulating your brain chemistry, regulating your hormones, regulating your metabolism, all by these very smart fat cells. They're not just sitting there holding up your pants, they're actually dynamically interacting with your body all the time and we have to learn how to talk to them so they uh, actually are smarter. Now there's a food addiction scale, this is from Kelly Brownell, which talks about what are the behaviors that indicate you might be addicted to food. You consume certain foods if you're not hungry because of cravings. Anybody? Yeah, okay, a few of you. <laughs> Do you worry about cutting down on certain foods? You're trying like, oh, I'm not gonna eat this, I'm not gonna eat that. Do you feel sluggish or fatigued from overeating? Do you have health or social problems that affect your work or school because of food issues and you keep eating that way? Do you spend time dealing with your negative feelings from overeating certain foods? You know, people are shaking their heads. Do you have withdrawal symptoms? If you don't eat it, you feel agitated and anxious so when you cut down. Do you, you have distress around your food. You have your ability to function in life being affected, whether it's because you're overweight or because of health issues, and you need more and more of the foods to reach the same pleasure. So maybe one cookie would have done it, now it's uh, 10 cookies, right? So that's how, what happens, and this is the biology of food addiction. Um, and there's a lot of studies on this. There's human studies, there's animal studies, there's studies of tolerance. They even give people Narcan, you know, which is like 
what they get for opioid overdose, and they give them Narcan, and it blocks the receptors in the brain that affect, are affected by sugar, and it stops people from having cravings. It's pretty interesting, and it can actually induce withdrawal symptoms. So when they studied cocaine and sugar in animal models, they give the rats uh, cocaine IV, and they can hit the lever as much as they want. They'll always switch to sugar. If they have unlimited access to cocaine, they'll always switch to sugar, and they'll work eight times harder to get the sugar than they will the cocaine. Um, and this is a you know, crazy study that, that sort of documents that. And when you actually, in animals, you give them Narcan, like it actually stimulates withdrawal, like heroin withdrawal. Um, rats always prefer the IV cocaine. Um, the, the author said cocaine reward paled in comparison to the sweet reward. And that's crazy, right? But it's true. That's why we're eating three quarters of a pound. They even did studies, and these are horrible studies, they did studies where they would shock the rats. And even while they were getting shocked, they would stay with the sugar. They wouldn't let the sugar go because they were so addicted to the sugar. Uh, so this is a real phenomena, and uh, this is a fascinating study I was mentioning before, looking at uh, the effect of different types of uh, starch on the brain and, and metabolism. So basically took a group of overweight guys. They fed them uh, one type of milkshake one day and a slightly different milkshake the next day. But the milkshakes were the same in terms of everything. They were the same protein, fat, carbs, fiber, taste, everything. The only difference was one of them had a, a secret ingredient, which was a sugar source or a, a starch source that raised the blood sugar fast, and the other one didn't. And they couldn't tell which one they were eating. So even though they couldn't tell, the ones that had the ones that raised the blood sugar quickly actually had more hunger, their blood sugar went up, their cholesterol went up, and they also had tremendous activation of this area in the brain, which is like ground zero for addiction, the nucleus accumbens. And this is, even though they didn't know what they were eating, it was different. It wasn't like, oh, this is the donut, I know I'm getting pleasure. They didn't know they were getting the special one with the, with the more pleasure thing in it, but that's what happens when you eat sugar. So you don't want to eat science uh, projects, you know, you, won't, you don't want to eat I mean, there's 3,000 additives in our food. There's 600,000 industrial products. They're all different shapes, sizes, and colors of the same ingredients, which are basically uh, flour, corn syrup, and soybean oil, all processed in different ways. Uh, it's, it's kind of a bad situation. So overeating doesn't cause you to gain weight. It's actually the effect of the hormonal changes. This is from the work of David Ludwig at Harvard. He wrote a book called Always Hungry, which is about this whole phenomenon. It's a New York Times article about it. Uh, and he did a fascinating study where he took groups of people and he did a crossover trial, which is like the best kind of study you can do. Basically, you take the same group of people, you feed them a diet, give them a little break, feed them another diet, see what happens. You measure everything. So they're on their, their own control. And they gave them either a 60% fat diet with 10%, I think 20% uh, carbs, or they gave them a 60% carb diet with 10% fat. So very low fat, high carb, or very high fat, Low carb, and what they found was amazing. This was the same amount of calories. The people who had the higher fat diet actually burned 300 calories more a day. It's like running an hour a day without getting off the couch just by changing what you eat, the quality of the food, regardless of calories. They also had better cholesterol, they had better insulin, and insulin is really the problem here. When you have starch or sugar, your insulin levels go shooting up Insulin makes you store fat in your belly. It makes you hungry. It slows your metabolism. If you're a woman, it raises testosterone, and causes facial hair and hair loss on the head. If you're a guy, it lowers testosterone, lowers muscle mass. Uh, it prevents your fat from getting out of your fat cells, so it literally blocks your ability to actually release fat. So they, it's like a one-way turnstile on a subway you can get in, but you can't get out. Um, and when they did these studies of animals, the same thing with the fat, what they found was fascinating. They gave them uh, same calorie diets, one was high fat, low fat. They had to actually keep increasing the calories in the high fat group because the rats were losing so much weight. And when they opened them up, what they found was even though the ones that were eating the fat had more calories, uh, they were actually free of this abdominal fat. So all the rats eating the high sugar starch diet had this terrible belly fat that developed. So calorie restriction doesn't really work. Uh, it makes you hungry and it slows your energy. So you basically slow your metabolism and you get hungry, which is like the worst thing that can happen if you're trying to lose weight. So uh, who eats a low fat diet with sugar and carbs? Probably most of us in America, we're all taught to eat low fat, but you know, we sh maybe should be eating a lower starch sugar diet with more fat. Uh, and the key isn't to create this negative energy balance, which is calorie restriction. The key is 
lowering your drive to store belly fat. So testosterone is an anabolic hormone, right? It builds muscle. Insulin is also an anabolic hormone. It builds fat, which you don't want. Um, so you want to do things that help you automatically lose weight without trying, without effort, without hunger, without starvation. Uh, and it's really about controlling what you eat, not how much you eat. If I said to you, I'm going to give you a million dollars if you can hold your breath underwater for 10 minutes, how's that going to go? Not so great, right? You're not going to be able to do it, even though you want the million dollars, because you have the overwhelming drive to breathe. Well, the same part of your brain that controls breathing and also controls your eating. And so you, you cannot win by willpower. You can white knuckle it for a little while, but it always kind of shifts. You want to change the metabolic state of your fat and use this powerful new weight loss drug, which has the ability to change your gene expression, balance your hormones, improve your immune system, to fix your microbiome, improve your brain chemistry. The drug is uh, available to almost everybody on the planet. It has no side effects. It works faster and better. It's cheaper than any drug. Do you know what it is? It's food. It's what you put at the end of your fork. And I'm not saying this lightly. We had a patient in our Functioning for Life group at Cleveland Clinic recently who was diabetic on insulin for 10 years, heart failure, kidney failure, liver, fatty liver, high blood pressure, morbidly obese. She was 65. And in three months, she reversed her heart failure. She got off insulin in three days. She's off all her medications. Her kidney failure is better. And she lost 43 pounds. And all she did was change what she ate and didn't focus on how much. It's not about restricting or anything like that. Um, so how do we think about food? It's, food is not just calories, food is information. It's instructions that literally affects every aspect of your biology. And then think of it as like code. You know, like you can upgrade or downgrade your biological software with every bite. And it doesn't happen, you know, over decades. It literally happens over minutes. Uh, so all calories are not the same, right? I mean, if you think, about uh, 750 calories of a big gulp, which is 46 teaspoons of sugar, or 750 calories of broccoli, which is s sort of 21 cups of broccoli. I mean, you can't really eat that, but um, it has 35 grams of fiber, no, almost no sugar. Are they the same? Well, according to every science group, American Diabetic Association, American Heart Association, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, our government, the CDC, everybody says they're the same. Right? Calories in, calories out. Moderation. This is just one of the biggest myths perpetrated on our population that's driving so much of our problem. So when you have, for example, soda, it spikes your blood sugar, it raises triglycerides, lowers your good cholesterol, it causes high blood pressure, lowers testosterone in men, makes men lose their body hair, grow breasts, right? Men, uh, women get infertile, they go bald, they grow facial hair. So if you keep eating sugar and starch your whole life, by the time you're 65, men and women look about the same. And broccoli, on the other hand, you know, you've got a powerful disease-preventing substance. It's got tons of fiber, it prevents cancer, lowers cholesterol, helps detoxification, and lowers inflammation. Uh, all calories are not the same. And sugar is the worst uh, in terms of how it works. So how do you fix people? Well, you do a sugar detox, which is hopefully what a lot of you are going to do. And I've written a book called The 10-Day Detox. At Cleveland Clinic, we use something called the Renew Diet, which is very similar. And we help people work through this. And it's amazingly easy. And within, people have said to me, I've been addicted to sugar and carbs my whole life, and I, I know I can't do this. And within a day or two, they're completely fine, and they feel great, because we use science, not willpower, to change all your hormones, your brain chemistry, very quickly. So you want to reduce those hormones and those uh, brain chemistry molecules and the dopamine and all that stuff to lose weight, and it works much better. So what the heck should I eat? Well, it's really not that hard. Um, you want to avoid the deadly white powders, Right? You know, not just uh, salt, sugar, and cocaine, but uh, also flour. Uh, you want to uh, understand that bread is, even if it's whole wheat bread, is not a health food. Uh, any flour product uh, is going to be a problem. And it turns out that two tablespoons of table sugar is better for you than two slices of bread, even whole wheat bread, in terms of how it affects your blood sugar. Uh, so stay away from all that processed food. Uh, if you want sugar, add the sugar yourself. You're not going to put in 15 teaspoons of sugar in your food. Flour is just like sugar. Uh, this was Gail. She did the program. Uh, she basically was 40 pounds overweight. She had all sorts of other issues. Uh, I call it FLC syndrome. That's when you feel like crap. Uh, she had headaches, congestion. She had sinus issues, irritable bowel, eczema, acne, knee pain, joint pain, fatigue, depression. She was kind of a mess, and she's in her 40s. She felt awful. Uh, then she did the program. She looked great and felt great. 
Uh, she ended up having everything go away and lost 40 pounds as a side effect uh, just by doing it. It's not a weight loss program. It's a program that is using the science of functional medicine to create health. Uh, and the average person who does this has a 62% reduction in all symptoms from all diseases in just 10 days. It doesn't take a long time. So you go, I can't do this, but 10 days. You can do anything for 10 days, and then you get to choose. Do I want to feel like crap, or do I want to feel good? And you can decide what you want to do. But at least you know you have the potential to feel good. Many people say to me, Dr. Hyman, I didn't know I was feeling so bad until I started feeling so good. And I want that for all of you. So powerful reduction in all symptoms. Food is medicine. It's the most powerful drug out there. And I encourage you all to rethink your approach to dieting and food. And I would love to answer some of your questions. Uh, I'm going to just go through a few simple principles about what the best diet is, and then we're going to get to your questions. So the first is, um, uh, a lot of this is in my book, Food, What the Heck Should I Eat?, which is where I went through all the science and sort of took away all the mythology and said, what do we know? What do we not know? What are the things we all can agree on? What are the simple principles? And I came up with basically 12 principles of using food as medicine. Um, you know, and it includes eating good fats, it includes having good quality proteins, it includes eating a lot of phytochemicals, plant-rich diet, uh, and includes uh, all of that combined in this basic concept of the pegan diet, which is kind of a joke, because everybody's so extreme, you got paleo, vegan, you know, I was on a panel with two friends of mine, one was a paleo doc, one was a vegan cardiologist, they're fighting, I'm like, wow, well, come on guys, you must, if you're a paleo and you're vegan, I must be a pegan. And I thought about it, and I'm like, wait a minute, this kind of makes sense, and here's the common things. One, we all should be eating a low-starch sugar diet. Two, we should be eating a lot of vegetables. We have a plant-rich diet, so it should be non-starchy vegetables, 70 to 80 percent of your diet, by volume, should be plant diet. And that means on your plate, you know, you want to, you know, make protein a side dish, not the main dish, and you want fats to be most of your diet by calories, probably at least 50 percent. Uh, and you want lower glycemic fruit, you want high good quality fats, omega-3 fats, olive oil, avocados, nuts and seeds. There's debate about um, you know, saturated fat, but I think those are in moderation can be fine as well. You want to eat a lot, a lot of refined foods like refined oils. You want to stick with low dairy, particularly sheep and goat is better. You want to have organic, whole, fresh food, local. These are aspirational, obviously not always possible. If you're going to eat animal food, again, not always possible, but you want to eat animal food that's good for the animals, good for you, and good for the planet which are usually grown through sustainable regenerative things, not these factory farms. You want a mercury, low uh, mercury fish. You don't want to have big tuna, swordfish, halibut. Those are full of mercury. You want the smaller fish. I call it the smash fish, which is basically sardine, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, and herring. My favorite. Most people don't like those, but too bad. Um, you want to avoid a lot of gluten grains. Not, not everybody's gluten sensitive, but they tend to be very starchy. They tend to raise your blood sugar. Most of the people eating gluten are eating it as a form of flour. If you want to have wheat berries or rye berries or, rye or barley, you know, fine. But like most people, um, you know, have issues with this. Uh, and, you know, moderate amounts of whole grains, moderate amounts of beans. And if you can, you want to avoid all those things we should be eating. No one says, oh, I want more, my, more pesticides with my broccoli. Or how do I get more hormones with my beef? Or how do I get, you know, more additives and preservatives in my food? No, everybody agrees we shouldn't eat any of these things, but we eat a ton of them. In fact, we eat about three to five pounds per person per year. So these are the 12 principles. It's a pretty set of simple guiding principles that affects um, the ability to use food as medicine and actually have a wide range of diets. So that is my little speech about what to eat and why we're all sugar addicted, what to do about it, and how to use food as medicine. Dr. Hyman, we have a question off of Facebook. Jane wants to know, healthy food is so expensive when living on a really tight budget and it goes bad so quickly. What can she do? Yeah, so a couple of things. One, uh, there's a great guide from the Environmental Working Group where I'm on the board uh, called Good Food on a Tight Budget. So how do you eat food that's good for you, good for your wallet, and good for the planet? And there, you, know, you don't have to have a $70 grass-fed ribeye steak, right? There, there are ways of you know, eating healthy, good food that's not processed and making yourself. In fact, studies have shown you can, you can roast a chicken and have a salad and a baked potato uh, and some veggies for far less for a family of four than you can go to a McDonald's and have you know, uh, a happy meals for four people. So the, 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 it takes a little bit of thought, a little bit of work. Also frozen is fine. You can go to Costco, you can go to Trader Joe's, you can go get uh, to this bargain uh, big, big box stores and you can get uh, a lot of stuff that's really inexpensive, that's good quality. Frozen vegetables are often as good or better than uh, regular vegetables, especially frozen fruits. So there's ways to do it on a budget. And I've written a lot about that. 
A question from our audience. Um, what's the difference between this with vegetarians and vegans? So, uh, you know, the whole question of whether you should be a vegan or eat meat, uh, there's really three issues. One is moral, and if you're a Buddhist and you don't want to eat meat, I respect that, that's fine. Then there's environmental, and yes, animal factory farms are a huge contributor to climate change, and we shouldn't be eating any foods if we can from factory farms. And three is the health question. And I think there's a lot of controversy about that. I think there's a lot of ideology and belief and not a lot of really rigorous thinking about the science. And when you look at the science, the science really doesn't hold up when, when you look at what meat as being a cause of, of disease. Uh, processed meat, for sure, if you're having bacon all the time, that's probably not a good idea. But basically, eating animal foods as a part of your diet, not huge amounts, can be actually a helpful part of your diet. And they're very nutrient dense. Uh, if you are a vegan for various reasons or a vegetarian, you can do this. I have people who do vegan uh, higher fat diets. In fact, studies have shown that vegans who eat a high starch diet compared to vegans who eat a high fat diet actually uh, do much worse. They gain more weight, they have worse cholesterol, they have better, worse numbers than if they eat a high fat a vegan or vegetarian diet. So it's possible to do. Where does alcohol fit into this diet? Uh, with dinner. <laughs> Now, alcohol, uh, I think, you know, there's different kinds of alcohol. Like beer is a high-carb alcohol, wine a little bit less, and spirits are certainly lower. And, uh, you know, it can be part of a healthful diet. It's just the quantity, right? So I think the problem in America is a little bit is good, a little more is better. It doesn't work like that. A little, more, a little may be good, but then a little more may be a lot worse. So you have to be careful with the volume. Uh, thank you. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think, like brands that say that they're gluten-free, how reliable, like General Mills claims that all their cereals are gluten-free, and I just really have a hard time. Yeah. I mean, oats may or may not be, so if they're oat, mm -hmm. they often aren't, even if it says that it is, and there's been studies on that. I think, um, you know, there are a lot of things out there that say they're gluten-free, like, you know, potato chips. I mean, soda's gluten-free. I mean, so I think you have to be careful. When I see some health claim on a label, uh, it's a red flag for me that the food's bad for me. Like if somebody has to highlight how good something is, you know, it's kind of hysterical when you read, you know, on a bag of potato chips, gluten-free, GMO-free, this and that. I'm like, well, dairy-free. I'm like, yeah, well, potato chips are dairy-free. Like, so they put all these health claims on a label that make it sound good, but it's actually bad for you. We talked about your pagan or vegan diet. Um, and I was just wondering, why do you think it's not really in line with the pyramid that we show in school? And, well, um, yeah, well, the pyramid uh, went out of date a bit ago, um, and the pyramid was what drove our obesity epidemic. When the pyramid came out, which was eat six to 11 servings of bread, rice, syrup, and pasta a day, uh, and eat fat oils only sparingly, we listened. When they said eat less meat, we listened. When they said eat more, uh, refined oils and less saturated fat, we listen. When they said eat less butter, we listen. We ate more margarine. We did whatever the government told us to do as a population, and it's led us to have the worst diabetes, obesity, and chronic disease epidemic in the history of humanity. So it's been revised, uh, and the latest guidelines have been really changed. The latest guidelines from 2015 said, don't worry about fat. Eat less starch and sugar. Eat, you know, don't worry about dietary cholesterol. Eat more plant foods. So there was a lot of that in there. Uh, I think it's changed a lot, and I think the, the next iteration will be even better. From Facebook, what is an example of a lower glycemic fruit? So berries are great. Wild blueberries are great. Blackberries are great. Kiwis are fine. Uh, it's, you know, things like pineapple and melons, and, and those, those can be higher glycemic. And if you just kind of, you can just kind of Google uh, glycemic load or glycemic index of whatever food and find out what it is. Hello. A book many many years ago that suggested the order that you ate your food that if you want to eat fruit you should wait i can't remember a few hours after you had your main dinner you had yeah, I mean, there's food combining and food timing, and there's a lot of uh, sort of opinions about that. My worry is that people get overly focused on that and not just on the foundational principles of eating real food and getting rid of starch and sugar and getting rid of processed foods. And if you start there, that'll take care of 95% of the problems. Hi. Um, I have Crohn's disease, and I feel like dieting gets really difficult for me when it comes to eating the fresh fruit and vegetables because it, you know, obviously gives me other issues. Is
Is there anything that you can recommend for someone who's dealing with a digestive issue when it comes to this? Yeah, so the, the, the program we often recommend is very good at fixing digestive issues, which are often triggered by dietary components, including uh, gluten, dairy, and other, other issues. So by actually doing what we call an elimination diet, often Crohn's and colitis can get dramatically better. Uh, and so we focus on fixing the problem, ideally with functional medicine, and we do that at Cleveland Clinic in our, in our group programs, Functioning for Life, as well as our one-on-one -on -one visits, and we see amazing results. The key is, you know, how do we fix the cause of the problem, and then you'll be able to have more flexibility. What are your thoughts on the fasting diets and intermittent fasting? So there's a whole movement to look at, you know, how do we uh, look at weight loss differently, how do we look at aging differently, and there's been a number of innovations and research on a couple of different approaches, all of which sort of do the same thing. There's intermittent fasting, there's time-restricted eating, there's fasting mimicking diets, and there's ketogenic diets, and they all sort of do the same thing. Intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating is the idea that you'll eat within an eight-hour window. So you'll eat, let's say, from noon to eight or 11 to seven every day, and you basically skip breakfast. And the idea with that is it activates your metabolism, it actually helps correct insulin resistance, it helps you build muscle, it helps improve cognitive function, it helps your bone density, reduces inflammation. So people are finding it very effective and the research really supports the science behind doing that way of eating. Uh, even if you don't change what you eat, it still makes a huge difference. If you actually add changes in the quality of your diet to that, it's even better. Uh, fasting mimicking diets where you'll fast for a period of five days or modified fast or restricted calories that also can activate healing mechanisms. Ketogenic diets are essentially 70 to 80 percent fat, very you know, moderate protein and very, very low carbohydrate. And that, what that does is it switches you from sugar burning to fat burning. And that means you literally have a different fuel source which gives you more energy, more cognitive clarity, reduces body fat, improves muscle mass, helps with so many different things. It's not for everybody, but it's a very powerful diet for diabetes. We're seeing 60% of diabetes being reversed using ketogenic diets. A lot of people are asking about your books. Can you kind of give us the laundry list of books that... Uh, well, I've written 14 <laughs> books. I'm not going to list them all, but the last few are really good. One is Food, What the Heck Should I Eat?, which is about what the heck should I eat, which people ask me all the time. Uh, the one before that was called Eat Fat, Get Thin, about the science of fat. Uh, the one before that was the 10-day detox diet, which is about sugar addiction, uh, and that should get you going. <laughs> um, what from, uh, from Facebook, what advice do you have for someone who has gastroparesis and, is meant to, and has to avoid high fat, high fiber, and raw food? Again, you know, in general, because I can't give specific medical advice, um, for someone with gastroparesis, we think about what are the causes. So what's driving it? Is it diabetes? Is it uh, some other issue? Is it infection? So we often try to fix that. Uh, if you do have it, you can use digestive enzymes or other supports or things that help move things through your gut, uh, various herbs we can use, supplements. So we sort of customize that approach. Thank you for being here. This information has been great. What advice would you give? I have hypothyroidism. Does this diet plan conflict with that, or would it be helpful? So one in five women have low thyroid and one in 10 men, and it's common. Um, and this can help it if it's triggered by some food-related things. We know, for example, gluten can cause Hashimoto's, so there's some ways of regulating it through diet. Uh, but no, it, there's no issue with eating this way. And this isn't a diet. Again, these are principles for living. Now, if you want to do a more sort of sugar detox, that's a more extreme version, which you would do for a period of time and then transition off of. Does the time you eat matter? Yeah, well, we're talking about intermittent fasting. So you don't want to eat within three hours before sleeping because you're going to store it, not burn it. Uh, intermittent fasting is worth trying for some people. Some people really shouldn't do it. People who are too thin or people who have cancer, certain women really don't tolerate it very well. Uh, but, but, you know, eating Eating uh, in a time-restricted area can be very effective, but doesn't have to be done for everybody. You can still manage without that. I think eating before bed is a bad idea. I know I have to. Anyone else have any questions? <laughs> if the American diet is so bad, what countries, what diet is good, the best, and why is it the best? Uh, which countries have a better diet than us? Well, many countries traditionally did. Um, but now we're seeing uh, that we've created the worst diet on the planet and are exporting it to every country. 
Uh, and so 80% of the world's type 2 diabetics are in the developing world. We're seeing massive rates of obesity and diabetes even in places like Haiti, uh, Africa, Asia. Uh, and so uh, unfortunately a lot of the traditional diets that were really helpful are, are actually now changing. But things like the Mediterranean diet, uh, Asian diets can be very helpful. Uh, you know, just eating real food is basically the bottom line. That's all people had before, only had real food. All right, anyone else? All right, Dr. Hyman, thank you so much. A lot of people have been asking, um, we will save this video, and uh, it will be accessible to anybody who wants to watch it online or share it on their Facebook page. Any final thoughts? I just think, realize, uh, you know, like one of my patients said, Dr. Hyman, I didn't realize I was feeling so bad until I started feeling so good. That you're only a few days away from feeling good, and that by making a change in the way you're eating, if it's dramatic enough for a short period of time, can have profound effects. And I encourage everybody to try it. You can listen to me talk for a thousand hours, doesn't matter. Do it for 10 days, it's just 10 days. See what happens and learn how your body feels when you start to put in the right stuff and take out the bad stuff. Great advice, thank you so much. Thank you.